Well, good evening to everyone. The holidays have brought some guests our way. We're glad you're here. And uh, thankful you've had safe journeys. We're in a study of authority here in this class, and we just have, after tonight, three more, two more classes left after tonight. So if you're coming in on this, you're catching the tail end, and uh, just assume that uh, I've been right on everything up to this point, and then, <laughs> and then you'll, you'll be able to accept tonight's lesson. No, I'm, I'm thankful that we've had this opportunity to teach this, and I've enjoyed teaching it with Eric because it is so important. It's so fundamental in our study. And I'm, I'm hoping that this has been helpful to everyone, and the things we discuss tonight will be helpful also. Got a lot of ground to cover. Don't know if I'm going to finish this tonight or not. But let's bow for a moment of prayer. Our Holy Father, we have been blessed this day. You've continued your <clears throat> spiritual blessings upon us. We continue to have the blessing of being your children and of having an eternal hope that sustains us. We're blessed to be together as your people tonight, that we enjoy your grace and we enjoy by your providential hand this opportunity to be together. We pray that our study tonight in here and in all the classes will be edifying, help us to increase in our knowledge, and help us to grow in our commitment to serve you faithfully every day. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, we started Sunday a, a discussion of God's authority over His church, which meant we had to spend some time talking about the meaning of that term. Our basic principle which we have been following all through this class is that we give final authority to whatever the scriptures say on any topic and upon what it teaches. And so we have been using this circle of authority. The circle represents everything the scriptures authorize. Everything outside of the circle is not authorized. And we talked about putting things in the circle. That there's something you would like to do in service to God. What do we have to have in order to put it in the circle? Right, we've got to have a scripture. To put anything in the circle, you have to have a scripture. And that's the principle we've been following because that is the principle we've clearly established from scripture. If you can't give scripture for what you're doing, then you don't have authority to do it. And uh, so every topic we studied through this is operated on that principle. So as we talk about the church and its purpose or its mission, we talked about defining the term in the very beginning. The Greek term ekklesia is the term we find in the New Testament that is translated church, that uh, uh, we apply and the scriptures apply in most cases to the Lord's church. But very quickly, we talked about the basic meaning of the term as simply group or assembly. That is how the term was used in the first century. Uh, it is actually based upon two Greek terms, a preposition, ek, which means uh, uh, to call forth or to come out of. Uh, and then the second half of the word, the klesia, refers to group or assembly. Now, we often make the statement, well, then that means that the church is a group of called out ones. But actually, we have to use the term the way it is used during the first century. Just like any word that we use, it changes its meaning or how it is used over time. Uh, if you have a King James Version in 1 Corinthians, I think, 16, it says, quit ye like men. Is he telling uh, gospel men they need to quit? No, that word's meaning has changed. And so we use a different word to change, like to, to stand like men or be firm like men. By first century times, this term simply meant assembly or group. And we find it used in that way in the New Testament. Did I do that? Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. And when you talk about it as being a group, you have to let context decide. It's determined by the modifiers of the term. And so we do find it used many times uh, attached to phrases like of God or of Christ, of the firstborn ones, the church which is his body, Ephesians 1.23. 
which tells us in those instances what kind of group you're talking about. It's one that belongs to God or belongs to Christ, one that is representative of His body, which is made up of those who have been first born. We would suggest the idea of being born again. And so we have clear modifiers or identifiers in the New Testament that explain to us the use. And so when Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church, he was talking about his group, his group of people that he was going to establish and that he was going to build. That group that he refers to or that assembly there was a worldwide, universal, time-spanning group of people. It would never literally meet upon this earth. But it is referring to his group of people throughout the world, throughout time, uh, referring to that universal group of people. Figurative. Not a literal assembly or meeting. But we talked about then <clears throat> the the importance of or understanding what a local church is. We asked the question, can you be a Christian without being a member of the local church? And we talked about, yes, you can. And we gave the, uh, op the example of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 when he was baptized into Christ. He was not a member of a local church. I don't know if there was one in Ethiopia where he was going. But there is, there is the fact that you become a part of that universal group of Christians when you were baptized into Christ. But when we look in Acts 9, we find the example of Paul coming to Jerusalem after his conversion, and he attempted to join himself to the disciples. Well, was he not already a Christian like they were? Well, yes, he was. But he's talking about the sense in which he wanted to join, to be joined with this band of disciples. In order, to be, uh, in order to work with him. Now, they, did, they refused him at first, didn't they? They said, no, you can't be a part of this group. But Barnabas came forward and convinced them that he was sincere, that he no longer persecuted the church, and so he was then accepted into the group on that basis. And he was then banded together with that group of disciples. So we do see two main uses of the word, a worldwide universal time-spanning group, that idea of a physical group or assembly, but then also referring to a specific group of local believers, uh, such as the Church of God, which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and other examples of that. Again, what we have to understand is that ecclesia in the New Testament Fundamentally, it was a common term. It wasn't a religious term. But in the New Testament, we see it begin to be applied to uh, the Lord's people, taking that common term. And ecclesia, we learn its meaning from the context. The university church is an ecclesia, that is a group of people that meets in the university area. It is a group of Christians who have banded together and to whom others come to join themselves to in order to work as a local church. And we find that idea. Now, here's what we want to really concentrate upon tonight. And that is, what does this local body of believers, or what role does this local body of believers play in God's plan? Exactly where does a local church fit in to God's plan? Why do, why do we find local churches in the New Testament? Was this just an idea that men came up with when there were a bunch of Christians in the area and said, hey, we ought to get together. Let's organize and let's figure out how we want to organize here. So let's, you know, set up leaders or committee or whatever, and we'll vote and see how we want to do this. Of course, that's not what we find in the New Testament. Rather, we find... Uh, churches being established, local churches being established in different places throughout Acts, particularly by the Apostle Paul. And we find specific things that were characteristic of them. So as we look in the New Testament, <clears throat> we look in Acts, Paul has established many churches going through Asia Minor. He begins to go back by those churches, and in Acts 14 and 23, what does it say Paul did concerning some organization to those local churches? He remembers. 
What did he do? He appointed elders in every church. Here is something you find consistent throughout the New Testament. There were some men, a plurality of men, who were appointed elders in every church. This group of men has different terms applied to them in the New Testament. Elders, overseers, bishops, shepherds, presbyters, uh, pastors are all used to refer to these men who were leading in a local church. And so you find uh, uh, the church, the Philippian letter addressed to the church with its uh, elders and deacons. So we see there some organization being given to it. The oversight of these men, what, how uh, wide was the oversight of these elders that he appointed in these local churches? All right, that local church, that's what we find. Every church had elders appointed in it. And so that's what they oversaw. One time I was in Birmingham, got a letter from a congregation. And the elders in that congregation said, we, this was in, in Alabama now, in Birmingham, said, we have assumed the oversight of this new congregation in, in North Carolina. Okay, so now they had the oversight of the local church where they were, and now they had the oversight of a congregation several hundred miles away in North Carolina, as far as they were concerned. It was a new work that didn't have elders yet, so we'll just be elders for them too. There's nothing in Scripture like that at all. There is no example of elders having oversight beyond the local work. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, Peter talks about, I who am your fellow elder, he says, shepherd the flock which is among you. That's what they shepherd. They shepherd that local work. And so we find this pattern as we look at it in the New Testament. Uh, you began to see this local group of believers. It has oversight. That's what the elders were. We also find deacons referred to. Again, Philippians 1 and verse 1, it talks about being addressed to the church with its elders and deacons. So we find something else here. There were servants, apparently, in a special sense. There, uh, the term deacon simply means servant. But we find that there is a group which apparently are called upon to meet certain qualifications that can be trusted, reliable men in the congregation to serve the group, to serve the group as the elders would call upon them to do things. Do deacons possess any authority? No, they do not, none. They possess no authority. They are simply servants in a local church. Those who are charged to oversight see the local church are the elders. And uh, deacons, as I say, are simply a special group of servants who are called upon to carry out uh, works, services that they're called upon to do by the elders as they see needed in the congregation. Oversight rests only in elders. Deacons do not have authority. Now they may be charged with a certain area of responsibility and asked to carry that out. Some might say that's delegated authority. I, I hesitate to call it that. Uh, they are simply doing what they've been asked to do by the elders. So we have to understand really what we're not establishing here is a hierarchy where you've got Christ as the head, you've got the elders as the neck, then you've got the deacons right at, under them, and then you've got the rest of the church. No, that's not really what we have in the New Testament. There is not that hierarchy. There are the elders who actually are part of the body just like everybody else, but have been called upon by them to uh, serve them in the special way of giving oversight, of guiding and leading. And the deacons, which are also scattered throughout the body, who now are called upon also in a special way to be servants in the church. I don't even like the illustration of Christ as the head and the elders as the neck <laughs> and then all the other Christians. The elders are part of the body too. They are subject to Christ just like everyone else, but they have been called upon 
to serve as uh, those who guide and shepherd and oversee the flock. That's what they do. And meeting the qualifications spelled out, they are in that position, uh, doing what they have been asked to do by the congregation, fulfilling a role that God said a local church needs. Their authority itself rests only in the Scriptures. They must be able to point to Scripture and say, here is the authority for what we're asking you to do or what we're asking the local church to do. They do not have some kind of autocratic authority uh, whereby they can just do anything they want. They are guided by Scripture. They must listen to their head just as everyone else must listen to the head. And so there, I believe it's very important that we understand what this is. Now, where do evangelists fit into this hierarchy? The preachers. Right about the elders, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> You can leave, Josh. <laughs> uh, do, elder, uh, do evangelists have authority in the local church? What are they often called in denominations? Pastors. And they confuse the role of the evangelist or the preacher with the role of elders or the overseers. Pastor is a term that's applied to the elders, the overseers. It's not applied to evangelists or preachers in the New Testament. An evangelist, a local group may have an evangelist, it may not. But if they do, the evangelist, the preacher comes to work with them, not for them. That's a very important distinction to understand. They agree to work together. The reason for that is a preacher of the gospel must have the independence to preach and teach what he thinks is needed by that congregation, to address problems, to address false teaching. That's what he does, and he has that responsibility to do that. Now, that doesn't say that he and the elders do not work together, that uh, they are not hopefully, they are hopefully in step with one another about the things that need to be taught and working together with that. But an evangelist must have the independence to challenge the elders if they're violating Scripture. He is asked to work with a group, not for it. He is not an employee of the local church. Uh, so keep that in mind as we look at the pattern in the New Testament. That's what we have when we look at it. Any thoughts or comments? I'm, I'm going along here without giving opportunities to. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, it works. Yeah, it works. That's right. Here. You listen to Scripture and the simplicity of what is revealed. You appoint men that are qualified as elders and understand the role that they play. You get deacons, qualified deacons, who are willing to serve the congregation. You have a congregation who's willing to submit to the leadership. It works. Every role playing its part, every part of the body working together as God wants it to work together. That's what it must be doing. So it is a very, very simple type of organization. We have qualifications for elders and deacons spelled out very clearly in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And elders must meet those specific qualifications. Deacons must meet the qualifications spelled out. It's not as, <clears throat> Dad told me about a situation you knew of one time where uh, uh, they were appointing elders in some church somewhere, and he said, one, he heard, he, one guy supposedly said, well, why don't we appoint so-and-so an elder? I think if we do, he might start coming on Wednesday night. <laughs> now, that's probably not the best way to decide who you want as an elder in a local congregation. If you look at the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, 
It is obviously a man of maturity who has that track record, who has the knowledge, the ability, and the wisdom, and the experience to function in that role. And it certainly involves more than just having believing children. Because sometimes I feel like that that's all some people considered. Well, he's older and he's got believing children. Well, he could be an elder. There's so much more that we need to look at in terms of, of, of elders. But all that is a local group working together. Uh, now, when we look at that local group, we find that with that simple structure or framework, this group exists because there are responsibilities that it has, that God is assigned to a local work. And so we began to look at the pattern again in New Testament of what, well, what was the local work for? Why did God want local churches to exist? What is their function? And so again, we go to Scripture to try to establish what local churches did. So let's mention some things they did. They worshiped together and edified one another, did they not? We have that clear pattern in, in many different places in the New Testament where brethren met together. They met together to worship, to pray, to encourage one another. Uh, we know that upon the first day of the week they assembled together to partake of the Lord's Supper. Preaching was done in those assemblies, but they met together to worship and to edify one another. In that worship, they were to remember the suffering and death of the Lord, as Jesus has commanded. It was, that was a, a repetitive act or memorial. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. They prayed and they sang together. Uh, they did teach, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, you find the example of him talking about in their assemblies, about them singing together and about them praying together. They would teach and admonish one another. Again, you find that example in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 and in other places. Romans 15, 14, admonishing one another. That's a responsibility they had, even to judge one another. I mean, that's what the Corinthian church was failing to do in 1 Corinthians 5. They were not judging the brother who was living in sin, living with his father's wife. They weren't doing anything about it. That local church was called upon by Paul to judge that situation, to deliver such a one unto Satan in hopes that his soul might be saved, that is, by that bringing him to repentance. What we see then is there is this local fellowship, and if it's going to do these things of worshiping, edifying one another, as we illustrate here, then they must be a group that is determined to work together. They determine to band together and to follow the New Testament teaching concerning that. As someone comes and wants to join themselves to that group, then the group or its leadership makes a determination about the faithfulness of that person, if they're going to serve, I mean, uh, before they're accepted into the group. If they know that there's a sin in that person's life that needs to be corrected, then uh, they, before accepting them in the fellowship, should be addressing that. Uh, <clears throat> that's part of what that is about. That's part about when uh, one is in the group, like you have in 1 Corinthians 5, that is in sin, one who's already a member, uh, and they will not repent of sin, then they are to be separated from the group. That's a determination that is made. So it is a local group, a local fellowship, that bands together with that purpose to function in that way. Uh, but now there are other things that a local group does. We find, for example, them supporting the preaching of the gospel. Churches in the New Testament supported evangelists in their preaching. Philippians 4, verses 14 through 16, you find the Apostle Paul 
they're talking about how the Philippians sent once and again to his need, even on one occasion when they were the only ones sending to him. Paul received support in his preaching of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9, when he's talking there about his right to receive pay as a preacher, but that he did not do it, he's not talking about that he never did it. He actually seems to be talking about that situation in Corinth, that he's saying, I will not, I'm not going to accept funds from you. He had reasons for doing that. But the supporting of the preaching of the gospel, there are examples of that we can find throughout the New Testament. The way it was done was they knew an evangelist and they supported him directly. There was no mission organization that they sent funds to that then decided where money would go and what evangelists would, would be supported. The local church made its own determination. It decided what men they would support, both local or in other places. So they supported the preaching of the gospel. We find local churches uh, supporting each other and providing daily necessities. That is, when you find a local church, a local group in the New Testament, in which uh, there were those that were in need, fellow Christians who were in need, they were instructed to, and we have examples of where they took care of those needs. What's the first example of that in Acts? Right, the Grecian widows in Acts 6. They came to the apostles and said, we have widows here that are being neglected. And so they made arrangements to see that they were taken care of. And so the need or the responsibility of the local church was to take care of those benevolent needs. You also see that brethren on occasion knew of brethren in other places that were in difficult straits, that were at, without daily necessities and had needs, where money was sent to those churches. Uh, really, this is what the collection Paul is talking about continually in First and Second Corinthians, urging them to lay aside funds to help the brethren back in Jerusalem who were in very difficult situation. And he urged them to make collections for that reason. And in 1 Corinthians 16, where he's talking about them, that they should lay by and store on the first day of the week. And he said, when he came, then we can take those funds over there. You appoint men from your number to take these funds to Jerusalem, and they will be distributed to those local churches that are in need. And he said, if it be suitable, I'll go with them. Paul had plans to go to Jerusalem anyway. So benevolent needs of brethren were met by local churches. They saw that responsibility and they dealt with it directly. Now this direct dealing and fulfilling these things was what kept the organization and the function of local churches very simple. When you look at the New Testament church, there is a simplicity to it. And a local group of Christians can be established anywhere and it can operate independently under the pattern of elders overseeing it and if they're qualified men, deacons to serve in it. And then working together as a local group, even if it knows of no other church of the Lord anywhere, it functions independently answering to the Lord upon the basis of His Word. So there's an independence to the local church, and there's a simplicity to it, which keeps it from having to establish all kinds of different organizations and bodies and all kinds of things in order to carry out the Lord's work, because that's, that's what men do. Uh, Here's basic New Testament organization, what you find. You find these independent, autonomous local churches, each doing their own work. Antioch was one of the first 
uh, strong churches we read about in the New Testament. In fact, it was Antioch that sent Paul and Barnabas out on Paul's first preaching mission. And as a result, churches were established in other places. Were those churches under Antioch, under the church in Antioch that they established? No, they weren't. They were independent local churches who strove to be organized according to the New Testament pattern. They remained independent. In the New Testament, the Antioch church wasn't over the Corinthian church or over the Ephesus church. No church was over another church. No eldership in one church was over another church anywhere other than the, the group of, in which they were located. That's simple New Testament Christianity. That's the simplicity of the local work. And in doing that, it places emphasis upon the fact that we as Christians do most of our work not through the local church, but as independent Christians in our daily life. I think this is what is often missed in the New Testament. The New Testament church <clears throat> doesn't have other human institutions attached to it, other organizations set up to which churches send donations to do what is the work of the church. Local churches simply did the things spelled out. They worshiped and edified one another. They supported the preaching of the gospel. They saw that no member went without the daily necessities. Everything else the Christians did as individuals in their daily life. Well, there are some implications here. It implies for us individually that we must, we, we must strive to be a part of a local church, to benefit from these things that God gave to the local church to do. I hear many people in the world today who claim to want Christ, but they don't want organized religion. Now, uh, what they're talking about, I probably agree with them. <laughs> Because what they're talking about in terms of organized religion are large religious organizations or churches, worldwide organizations with a hierarchy which controls everything uh, and which many times will result in uh, causing divisions within the group, having corruption within it. It goes far beyond the idea of just local churches. Uh, but I think sometimes, consciously or unconsciously, some of us Christians manifest the same attitude. In that, and I mean by that, someone who says they don't want to be a part of organized religion. They, they don't want to really be involved with the local church. They want to be a Christian. But as far as getting involved in the work of the local church, they keep themselves at a distance. And it's like they're saying, yeah, I want to be a Christian, but, you know, I, I really don't. <laughs> don't get me involved in the organized things you do. I'm not sure what, that's what the scripture wants us, the attitude it wants us to have. We need to ask ourselves, why are we a member of the local church? Why do we attend here? Is it because, you know, the Bible says you're supposed to? You want to go to heaven, so you've got to do what the Bible says? Well, we need to do what the Bible says, but is that your motivation alone, that you're supposed to be a member of a local church? You come and worship on Sunday because you know you've got to do that to be counted faithful. You can be a faithful member because you attend. Do you do it to satisfy someone else? Keep your parents happy. Your girlfriend wants you to be there. Or your husband. Or you know it would please your employer if you went to church where he went to church. Why do we assemble? 
If you see yourself as a baptized believer saved by God's grace and yet you do not seek to be involved in the local church, are you really following what God wants you to do? Uh, The result is you do not receive the intended benefit that God meant for you to receive from the local church, to being a part of a group or a body of believers that is banded together for each other's support, and to help each other, and to edify one another, to help meet to one another's needs, both physically and spiritually. We need that group. We need that strength that comes from that, and that's why God established local groups to do that. It's a hard and godless world we live in, and we need each other. That's really what a local group is about. I need my spiritual family. I need the Lord today. I need to get recharged in the middle of the week by getting together with my brethren on Wednesday night, and getting some good teaching. I need those extra opportunities of special Bible classes or special lessons by a visiting evangelist. Uh, even the daily encouragement I receive from those brothers and sisters who know me. When one does not become involved in that local group, really you're failing yourself. And you're also failing a spiritual family that could be encouraged by you. That's a local group. What do you consider to be a good family? What does a good family need? I'll let you talk now. (laughs) What does a good family need? What? Guidance. Guidance, okay. We could say leadership, don't we? It needs guidance. It needs leadership. What else do you think is essential to to bond that group together? All right, there's got to be love for one another within that group. Uh, It's got to be a group that loves to be together. That looks out for one another. I had brothers growing up. One was nine years older than me. He and I never got in trouble with each other. But I had one just about three years older than me that I wanted to do everything he did, and he didn't want me tagging along all the time. But, you know, it literally was one of those situations between he and I where, you know, as you've heard said, nobody beats up my little brother but me. (laughs) He would defend me anytime, anywhere, and even did that at school on occasion. There is that bond of looking out for one another. And a good family has to have everybody doing its part, doesn't it? Everybody's got to contribute to the success of that family. Be positive contributors. Try to encourage each other. That's what makes a good family. And that's why we are referred to, I believe, by the Lord as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family. We are the household of God. That's critical to the success of this spiritual family. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we helping this family to be that kind of family? What am I contributing? How am I playing a part? Am I one who just does the minimum to be identified with this family? Or am I committed to being a part of it? A second bell on it. Well, I didn't get through, but Sunday, I want to talk about some things that I think are really critical to understanding that even though we must be a part of a local church, how do we define ourselves as being a participant in the local work? I think this is important. We'll, We'll look at that in some other things. All right, we'll quit there.